So in this video presentation, I'm going to try and recap some of the learning that we picked up during our conduit exercises. So we started our conduit lighting circuit and let's see what we learned while we were doing this exercise. The conduit itself is steel and steel conduit, the same as plastic conduit, comes in four standard sizes. They're 16 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 25 and 32 millimeters. That's not millimeters squared. It's the diameter of the conduit itself. Metal conduit comes in two common finishes. The one we installed here for our lighting circuit being zinc galvanized, as well as this one here, which is black enamel, not as often used now as zinc galvanized. The exam will ask us, why are we selecting one of the conduit systems over another? If it's a damp situation or outside, we would be using galvanized conduit because it doesn't corrode. Potentially the exam will ask us for a conduit system inside with strong mechanical protection and may require us to put black enamel in. Steel pipe covered in black gloss paint is our black enamel conduit. Our exam will also look at common fixings to hold the conduit system onto the wall. So when we talked about the metallic conduit, we talked about a number of different fixings and reasons for our exam why they would select that type of fixing. We started at the top and we had a plain saddle. It only had the front bracket on it and no back plates. And we said the plain saddle would be used for a smooth surface. We drop down, we have a spacer bar saddle, a small back plate and a front brace to hold the conduit in place. And we said that the space of our saddle would be used on irregular brickwork. We drop down to the saddle here, which is a distant saddle, has now brought the conduit further off the surface. The distant saddle was going to be used where the surface was damp. And finally, at the bottom, we had a hospital saddle. It's not the reason we're using it because we're in a hospital, but we do use them in certain areas in hospitals. The hospital saddle bridges the conduit further off the surface, allowing a cloth to go behind it, allowing it to be cleaned. So it's used in areas of high hygiene, such as canteens and some areas within hospitals. So to recap, we had the plain saddle, space of our saddle, distance saddle and hospital saddle. We also talked about the crampit and we said the crampit was used where a conduit was being buried in the fabric of the building. The crampit pins it back and then they reinstate the wall afterwards. We talked about the conduit providing mechanical protection. So in this case, steel conduits providing a high level of mechanical protection. Therefore, the conductors that go within it are single insulated PVC and the conductors themselves, again, are copper, but this time they're always stranded. They're stranded for greater flexibility as it's being pulled through the conduit system. If they were solid conductors, as they're being pulled in, they could work harden and eventually snap. We also talked about the minimum cross-sectional area of conductors for a lighting circuit. And we said when we're wiring a lighting circuit, the minimum size of cable is one millimeter squared. However, in a conduit system, we looked at that being upgraded to 1.5. There is talk about the one mil cable being stretched and pulled in could actually damage the conductors themselves. Therefore, the minimum size of wiring a lighting circuit for us is 1.5. And remember, the construction is stranded for greater flexibility. We also talked about exposed conductive parts. They're electrical and they're metal and need connecting to earth. The steel conduit is electrical and metal and therefore is an exposed conductive part. Metal clad light switch, exposed conductive part and the consumer units are all exposed conductive parts. The exam will expect us to differentiate between an exposed conductive part and an extraneous conductive part. Remember extraneous conductive parts being things such as a metal water pipe, a metallic gas pipe, the metal structure of a building are all extraneous conductive parts. However, if it's electrical, and metal is an exposed conductive part. Let's bring the camera forward now so we can have a closer look and we can discuss how we fix to our boxes the size of the overcurrent protection device. Do we or don't we need an RCD? Let's do that next. So we can see the terminations now of our 1.5 millimeter squared PVC singles within our consumers unit. The top of our circuit breaker has our line conductor and it's a B6, so it's six amps and it's a B type. We didn't use a C type for this installation as there are no inductive loads such as fluorescent light fins, so we stuck with a B6. It's a BSEN 60898 circuit breaker. And as we use Y1 in our consumer unit, Y2 being blank, we use neutral position one and CPC position one in the earth bar. So in the event of removing the circuit, we take out the line conductor at the breaker and then position one and one for the other two conductors would remove the lighting circuit itself. Almost by default, the circuit was protected by an RCCB. We've got it here as the, the main switch here at college. The lighting circuit itself does not require to be protected by an RCD. It's not in a domestic dwelling. The wiring system is also on the surface and not buried within the fabric of the building. 
Therefore, the RCCB is offering fault protection in circuit and not additional protection. Therefore, when testing the RCCB, we need to make sure it disconnects when one times the current, in this case it's rated at 30 milliamps, is found under fault conditions and disconnects within a maximum of 300 milliseconds in order to offer fault protection. The most common method of connecting to a box that has a knockout in it or you could drill a hole in it is by using a 20 mil in this case coupler. Could be 16, could be 25, it could be 32. The conduit's 20, so we've got a 20 mil coupler here. And these are threaded throughout their length, okay? And the conduit itself, if we could see beyond it, would be threaded all the way down just past halfway. So that is all threaded conduit in here. It's connected from the underside into the box using a brass male bush, which looks like this. So we've got a brass male bush coming up and into the area left free in the coupler. We tighten between the two, the box, in order to secure it. So that's the most common method of connecting to a box with a knockout in it, is by a coupler and a brass male bush. So on our final switch, we use a slightly different connecting method, one that's not that common, but requires us on the outside of the conduit, which is threaded to have a lock ring. Could be a lock nut, but in this case we used a lock ring. There's a number of threads going down into the box, of which on the inside is another lock ring holding it in place. So that will fasten between the conduit and the box to hold it tightly into place. And then where the conduit continues to protrude into the box to stop the cables from chafing as they exit the conduit, there is a brass female bush inserted in there. So this is a less common method of connecting a box. Again, it's a knockout box. We've knocked a hole in it, 20 mil hole, 20 mil conduit passes into it. The outside has a locking ring or locking nut. On the inside, there is either a locking ring or locking nut, and then a female bush at the point that the cables exit. So at the lighting points, we installed spouted boxes. In this case, it was a tea box. And then again, the inside of the actual spout is pre-threaded. So the conduit itself is only threaded under here and then obviously inserted into the box and tightened off using a pair of grips. The lamps that we were using had two pins, okay? And we remember from earlier learning that these are batten lamp holders and they take a bayonet cap lamp and it doesn't matter which pin is line and which one is neutral as these styles of lamps have no polarity. So it doesn't matter which of those ends here and here are line and neutral because the lamp itself has no polarity. Because I'm always conscious about the length of the videos, I'm gonna actually do this as part one. I'll do the socket circuits as a part two video presentation. So in this one, the lighting circuit, we'll recap the learning on steel conduit and wiring a lighting circuit, all information that's required obviously to work in industry, but also as we move towards our installation theory exam.